Welcome back to The Wheel on the School, Chapter 3. Chapter 3, Wagon Wheel. In the morning, it was school again. There they were in the schoolroom again, the five boys and Lena and the teacher. But this Saturday morning, they did not start out by singing the old, old song about their country. My lovely spot of ground, my fatherland, where once my cradle stood. No, they sat quietly as the teacher stood looking at each one of them in turn. And then he said, who wondered why? And where did it lead you? Lena's hand shot up. To her amazement, every hand shot up with hers, even Yella's and Elka's. The teacher looked so happy and pleased about it. It made Lena furious. Why, teacher, they never did. They went ditch jumping. She clapped her hand to her mouth, but it was too late. She wasn't a tattletale. It was just that it had come boiling up out of her because it had made her so furious. They were fooling the teacher, and it was making him happy. The teacher looked at her a short moment. He seemed surprised. He turned away from her to Yella. Yella sat there in the front seat, big and stubborn and angry. He was really angry with her. But the teacher was saying, Well, Yella, and what did you think was the reason why storks do not come to Shora? Oh, I didn't think, Yella told the teacher honestly. I asked my mother. The teacher smiled. Well, next to thinking, asking is the way to become wise. What did your mother say? She said storks don't come to Shora because they never did. She said storks go back every year to the same nesting spots. So if they never came to Shora, they never will. So there's just nothing to be done about it, she said. Lena sat in her seat trembling with eagerness to tell them that storks had once come to Shora to tell them what Grandmother Sybil had said. She wanted to wave her hand frank frantically, but all the boys were angry with her. And even the teacher had been surprised and disappointed. It was a woebegone feeling, but still she had to do something. She quivered with eagerness. Then she was waving her hand, almost getting up out of her seat, but the teacher didn't take notice. She had to tell them. Lena heard herself saying out loud, Oh, but storks did once upon a time come to Shora. They all turned to her, even the teacher. The next moment, Lena was excited, excitedly telling the room the story that Grandmother Sybil had told her about Sybil's Corner and the storks and the willow trees all around and the moat with the footbridge, about storks right here in the exact spot where the school now stood. She even told about the pickerel in the moat. Yella stood in the front seat. Yella in the front seat turned right around when he heard about the pickerel. He forgot he was angry with her. He forgot he was in school. He just said right out loud without permission, Oh boy, pickerel, were they big, Lena? All the boys had big, excited eyes. They seemed to be much more interested in the pickerel than in the storks. All but Elka. Elka, had, Elka raised his hand, and now he was saying in his slow way, What Lena said about trees. You know, teacher, that is exactly what I thought when I wondered why. Storks don't come to Shora because we have no trees. Elka's desk was next to Lena's. She twisted in her seat to stare at him. How did he dare? He'd wondered why. He'd gone jumping ditches. It was a it was as if Elka knew what she was thinking, for he calmly told the teacher, I don't suppose I would have thought of trees. It was really when I jumped right smack into the middle of a ditch and went under that I thought of it. 
I really got soaked, and I wished there was a tree to hang my clothes on. But there aren't any trees, so I had to go home dripping wet. Boy, did I catch it from my mother. The teacher laughed as long and, as, and hard as the class. Even Lena had to laugh. Well, Elka, the teacher said, even though you had to do your thinking underwater, it was still good thinking. His eyes were bright with laughter as he turned to the class. All right now, does everyone agree with Elka that the number one reason why storks do not come to shore is because we have no trees? He turned to the blackboard and wrote in big letters, the reasons why storks do not come to Shora. Under the words, he put a big number one and waited. I still think the number one reason is what my mother said, Yella spoke up. Ah, but Lena has just told us that storks used to come to Shora. In fact, Yella, Grandmother Sybil III has seen storks nesting above the spot where you are sitting now, where our school now stands. Imagine it, said the teacher. I guess maybe my mother was wrong, Yella said slowly. He seemed to hate to have to admit it. He looked up at the ceiling in a troubled way. Then Alka raised his hand and quietly said, Then the number one reason is still no trees. That's what Grandmother Sybil thinks too, Lena told the class honestly. She says storks like shelter and trees and hiding and a shady place to rest their long legs. She said she would if she were a stork. And Grandmother Sybil told me the way to find out what a stork would want is to try to think like a stork. The teacher stood looking at Lena. Is that what Grandmother Sybil III told you? I think that is wonderful, he said. He turned back to the class. Well, are we agreed then that the number one reason for no storks in Shora is no trees? He turned toward the board with his chalk as if to write it down. Lena frank frantically waved her hand to stop him. Not trees, roofs! She almost shouted when the teacher did not t turn. Teacher, she said desperately to the teacher's back. Even though Grandmother Sybil and everybody thinks think it is trees, it has to be roofs. Storks don't just build nests in trees. They build their nests on roofs too. But our roofs in Shora are too sharp. Oh, it just has to be roofs, she pleaded because we can put wheels on the roofs for storks to build their nests on, but we can't do anything soon about trees. Breathlessly, she told the class about Grandmother Sybil's candy tin with the picture of a whole village on its lid and stork nests on every roof because there was a wheel on every roof for the storks to build their nests on. Pierre and Dirk um, said almost together, Oh, man, imagine a nest on every roof in Shora. Even on the roof of our school, Alka shouted. But that's just it. That's just it. Lena all but shouted at them. There's not a single wheel on any roof in Shora. Because just like Grandmother Sybil, everybody else must have figured it was no trees. So nobody ever put up a wheel. Nobody even tried. But how can we know if we don't try? Lena sat back, waiting breathlessly, hopefully looking at the teacher. Oh, she had to be right. Teacher had to think it was right. The teacher liked their excitement. He stood before the blackboard, turning the piece of chalk in his hand, in no hurry to write, it, to write anything down. He looked at the boys who were still looking in surprise at Lena. He looked at Lena. Aha, he said proudly, little Lena. And then he wrote on the blackboard Lena's reason in big white letters. No wheels on our sharp roofs. He turned back to the class. Could it be, 
he asked. If we put wheels on our sharp roofs, could there be storks on every roof in Shora, the way Lena saw it in the picture on the tandy candy tin? Ah, oh, that was just a picture, Yella said scornfully. You can put anything in a picture. All that is is a dream. Ah, uh, yes, that's all it is, the teacher said. As yet, but there's where things have to start, with a dream. Of course, if you just go on dreaming, then it stays a dream and becomes stale and dead. But first to dream and then to do, isn't that the way to make a dream come true? Now, sit for a moment, picture it for a moment, our Shora with trees and storks. Now, Shora is bare, but try to see Shora with trees and storks and life. The blue sky above and the blue sea stretching behind the dike and storks flying over Shora. Do you see it? Trees won't grow in Shora, Yella argued stubbornly. It's the salt spray and the wind and storms. There's only one tree in Shora, and that's a small cherry tree in the backyard of Legless Yanis. But the yard's got a high wall around it, so high you could hardly climb it. The cherry tree grows against the sunny wall of the house, and Yanis pets it and guards it. He won't let a bird or a kid get even one cherry, not one. Well, but doesn't that show us something? The teacher said that to raise trees in Shora, in Shora we must perhaps protect them. And could we raise trees that could withstand the storms and salt spray stouter and stronger than willows? There must be trees that grow along the sea or maybe we would have to protect the willows with the windbreak of, pop, of poplar trees. The point is, if trees once grew here, couldn't we make them do it again? Oh, but that would take too long, Dirk said. That would take years. Making dreams become real often takes long, the teacher said. I don't mean that it should be done at once. Our first problem is how to make just one pair of storks come to nest in Shora. That is what we are trying to do right now by first thinking out the reasons why the storks don't nest in Shora. But after that, if trees once grew where our school now stands, wouldn't they grow there again? Think of it, trees all around our school. And a moat with pickerel in it, Yellow promptly added. We boys could even dig it ourselves and Lena could make hot chocolate milk for the diggers. Yes, Yella, now you are getting into the spirit of it. For that matter, we could even plant our own little trees. But first, before we could even start to think of all that, what must we do? Find a wheel to put on a roof, Lena promptly cried. Aha, the teacher said. Now we are getting to something that we can do. Now do you see? We wondered why and we reasoned it out. Now we must do. Now we must find a wagon wheel and then we must put it up on a roof. But behind doing that lies the long dream. Storks on every roof in Shora. Trees, maybe even a moat around the school. Can you picture our Shora like that? Excitement was in his voice. Excitement was in the whole room. Lena couldn't sit still. She squirmed and squirmed, and then her hand shot up. And a footbridge leading right to the door. We'd go over the put footbridge to school, teacher, she pleaded. Teacher, I could get Grandmother Sybil's candy tin. Then we could all see what Shora would be like with storks and trees. The teacher nodded. Run there, Lena. Grandmother Sybil III had no objections whatever to Lena's taking the candy tin to school. Oh, no, child, keep it there as long as you like. Keep it until you get real storks in Shora. She opened the tin and took out a wine ball. Why, enough, why enough left for a wine ball for each of you. 
In the schoolroom, they passed the candy tin around from hand to hand, and each one looked at all the pictures on the sides and on the lid. Each took out one wine ball before reluctantly passing the tin can, passing the tin on. The teacher took out the last wine ball and then put the candy tin on the top ledge of the blackboard on its side so that the village with the trees and the storks on every roof could be seen from every point in the room. And underneath the tin, he wrote on the blackboard in big letters, Could it be? He turned back to the class. Imagine a zebra in Shora, he said. Imagine the long necks of two giraffes poking over the top of the dike. Imagine a giraffe running along our dike. Imagine a lion in Shora, Aka said. Yes, Aka, even imagine a lion in Shora, the teacher surprisingly agreed. A good lion, a gentle lion in our street. But isn't it almost like that with storks? Do you know where our storks come from? Where they are when they aren't in Holland? Imagine the heart of Africa, the head of a big river deep in Africa where it isn't a river anymore, but little rivulets and reedy swampland and marshes that go to make the beginnings of a big river. That's where our storks are now right there among the zebras and the herds of gazelles, among the lions and the buffaloes. Do you see our stork? There's an old rhinoceros right behind him, skulking in the brush. Do you see the stork standing on the banks of the river where the river begins? Just beyond him in the swampy river is a herd of hippopotamuses, snorting and blowing in the deeper water. And the stork lives among them until a time comes and the big noble bird spreads his great wings, flaps his big wings, and comes out of the wilds of Africa to live among us. A great wild bird, yet tame and gentle, living among us in a village. Isn't it wonderful? And maybe, just maybe, it's still a dream. We haven't even a wheel as yet. We don't even know what roof will put it on. Oh, yes, we do. Oh, yes, we do. The whole class shouted. It's got to go right on the roof of our school. Why, yes, the teacher said. Why, yes, class. Then who's going to look for a wagon wheel? Look for a wagon wheel where one is and where one isn't. Where, where one could be and where one couldn't possibly be. They were all too breathless to say a word. But Yella hastily swallowed his wine ball whole, then blurted it out for all of them. We all are, for the, from the moment school is out until we find one. The teacher nodded and nodded. That's how we'll begin to make a dream come true. We'll begin at noon. It's Saturday, and we have our afternoon free afternoon before us. We'll have a whole afternoon to try to find a wagon wheel. We'll really work at it because that is how to start to make a dream come true. But now, let's turn to arithmetic. Bye. See you in chapter four.